Humbly, we acknowledge our part in his passion. Deeply, we yearn to understand the depth of this sacrifice. Solemnly, we gather this day to pray and worship together, giving thanks for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning and welcome to you. If you are here with us and if you're with us online, a very warm welcome to you on our Good Friday service. If you are able, we invite you to stand as we begin today.
We gather here today to read the story of the crucifixion of Jesus from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verses 16 through 39. We reflect on each aspect of Christ's journey to the cross, his sacrifice for us to save us from sin and death. The soldiers took Jesus to the palace called Praetorium. They called together the entire brigade and dressed him in purple and put a crown plated from a thorn bush on his head. They, then they began the mockery. Bravo, king of the Jews. They banged on his head with a club, spit on him, and knelt down in mock worship. After they had their fun, they took off the purple cape and put his cl own clothes back on him. Then they marched him out to nail him to the cross. There was a man walking by coming from work, Simon of Cyrene, father of Alexander and Rufus. They made him carry Jesus' cross. The soldiers brought Jesus to Golgotha, meaning Skull Hill. They offered him a mild painkiller, wine mixed with myrrh, but he wouldn't take it. Then they nailed him to the cross. They divided up his clothes and threw dice to see who would get them. Join us in singing the refrain with us. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, who nailed him up at nine o'clock in the morning. The charge against him, the king of the Jews, was scrawled across a sign. Along with him, they crucified two criminals, one to his right, the other to his left. People passing along the road jeered, shaking their heads in mock lament. You bragged that you can tear down the temple and then rebuild it in three days? So show us your stuff, save yourself. If you're really God's son, come down from that cross. Shame and scoffing root in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a savior. The high priests, along with the other religious scholars, were right there mixing it up with the rest of them, having a great time poking fun at him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Messiah is he, King of Israel? Then let him climb down from that cross. We'll all become believers then. Even the men crucified alongside him joined in the mockery. Guilty, helpless, lost were we. became extremely dark. The darkness lasted for three hours. At three o'clock, Jesus groaned out of the depths, crying loudly, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders who heard him, who heard him said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran off, soaked a sponge in sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. But Jesus, with a loud cry, gave his last breath. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah, what a Savior. At that, that moment, moment the, the temple curtain ripped right down the middle. When, when the, the Roman captain, standing guard in front of him, saw, saw that he had, he quit, had quit breathing, he this said, has to be the this has to be the he, Son he of said, God. He said, this has to be the Son of God.
Jesus, we, we, today we pause to remember your sacrificial love that shone light into the darkness, that bore life from such emptiness, that revealed hope out of devastation, that spoke truth through incrimination, that released freedom in spite of imprisonment, and brought us forgiveness instead of punishment. Thank you that we can now walk in the light of your life, hope, truth, freedom, and forgiveness. This day and every day. Amen. T together, let us say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, out in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, on earth be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I smile when I look at family portraits. I love looking at albums of family pictures that have been taken over the years, both of the family I grew up in and also our family here in Toronto. And my dad's camera made for great pictures. He called it, it was an old German camera that he bought in the 1950s, and he called it his Voigtlander. He, he would not ever part with it even when newer cameras came along. And it had this manual timer that uh, he would set and put on a tripod, set the timer, and then run in to our photograph for the family photo. And so he would push down the shutter, and the ticking would start. And sometimes the ticking as we stood there would stop, and we would all start laughing, thinking that it had got stuck. And right when we were all laughing, the camera would go click. And so the camera actually tricked us on a number of occasions. It seemed that as soon as we started laughing, the camera would click. It made for some really funny family portraits. Back then, we had to wait for them, as you remember, coming back from the developer. And today in our family, uh, we sometimes have funny family photos as well. But this time, it's our dog's antics that make us laugh. Uh, very rarely, once in a while, Hadley will cooperate with our family photos. But I love looking at them. I have binders at home of family photos. And even as a child, I would sit and just look through them, thinking of all the memories and all of the things that would uh, come back to my mind as I would see every family member in those pictures. In fact, the photos somehow capture even sometimes the personality of the people and who they are in the pictures. Rico Tice, in his amazing little book, Capturing God, says, imagine being offered one photograph that captured the essence of God. Imagine that God offered to hang in a frame an image that revealed everything that he wants to reveal about himself. Well, what would you expect to see? Maybe a picture of Jesus holding a little lamb, or Jesus talking to little children. Perhaps for some people, they would just think of an old man sitting on a throne, or maybe some, for some people, even just a bright light and nothing else. But as you draw near to this image, you recoil with horror. Because in this middle of this frame, you see a barbaric execution. Does that sound bizarre to you? That this is the manner that God would choose to reveal himself to us? And yet, this is what today's passage that you heard the two girls reading to us, this is what this, today's passage is claiming. The picture 
the best picture that captures who God is is a portrait of a man hanging on the most brutal instrument of torture and execution that humankind has ever invented. Now, I believe that we've been numbed to the horror of that image, perhaps because of crosses that we hang around our necks or crosses on the top of church buildings. But think about it. Imagine if we had as our symbol at the front of our church an electric chair. Would that seem a little bizarre to us? You see, our symbol is not a manger reminding us of Jesus' birth. Our symbol is not a large stone, round stone, reminding us of Jesus' resurrection. It's a cross. It's a cross pointing us to Jesus' death. A cross that has at its very beginning that first Good Friday, 1991 years ago, and no other religion celebrates the death of its founder as the center of its faith. But we focus on it. Why? Because the portrait of Jesus hanging on that cross is the best portrait of who God is. It best captures who God is. And it's not a pretty message. As these girls read it, you heard the horror of the message. But it may be the most important message that you will ever, ever hear. A number of people said to me this morning, I'm here today because this is the most important day of the year, and it truly is. And for those of, uh, of, those of you who have been with us ever since the beginning of September, you will know that we have been steadily working through the Gospel of Mark, and today we come to the climax of this breathtaking journey that we have been on, and our series is called Following Jesus, and today's message is entitled The Cross, The Shocking Portrait of God. But before we discover the message behind the songs we just sang and the passages we just heard read to us, let's pause to pray. Would you pray with me? God in heaven, this morning as we gaze at Jesus and the cross, we need your help. Help us to see who you are. Help us grasp how much you love us. It's beyond human comprehension that you would do this for us. And so we need your help to see you in this portrait. In Jesus' powerful name, we ask this. Amen. I encourage you to take your Bibles and open them to me, or open them with us, the passage that Sage and Dara uh, read to us this morning. We're not going to re- reread the entire thing, just a few portions. Mark chapter 15, verse 16 to 39. So take your Bibles and open them there. What does God want us to see in this portrait of Jesus on the cross? Well, Mark takes the scene and he divides it into three very vivid scenes. Each scene paints these brush strokes of who God is. And as Mark often does, for those of you who've been with us, you know this, as Mark often does, each of these scenes form a sandwich. And after the third scene, there's a bonus scene, one extra verse, which is the point of the entire passage and the entire portrait. The first scene, we're going to take a look at the first scene. The first scene starts and ends with cruel Roman soldiers. And in the middle of that scene is a contrast. A black man named Simon who is forced to carry Jesus' cross. Now here's the picture that's being painted for us. And it tells us something that we need to know about this true story. You see, the soldiers... As much as they like to think they are, they are not in control of what's happening. They only think they are. Here's what we learn about God in this first scene. Number one, God planned His own death to take our place. He planned it ahead of time. In other words, God, our sovereign ruler, orchestrated what appears on the surface to be the worst crime in all of history. Let me explain. Scene one begins in chapter 15, verse 16, with the soldiers leading Jesus into Herod's palace. 
and they put this purple robe on him, placing a crown twisted together of thorns from a Sisyphus tree on Jesus' head. And here they are, verse 18, calling out, Hail, King of the Jews! And again, they take a staff and they're striking him on the head. What's happening? They're driving the thorns into his forehead and into his scalp, spitting on him, mocking him by going down on their knees, paying homage to him. And Jesus is standing there and he is taking it. You see, he, Jesus knows that what's happening to him has been orchestrated since the beginning of time. In fact, over 700 years earlier, the pro- ancient prophet Isaiah foretold this very scene. The coming suffering servant says in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6, I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled up my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. How would the Roman soldiers know that the very thorns that they twisted into this ugly burlesque crown on Jesus' head were the symbol of the curse of sin created by God himself? You see, in the Bible, right since the very beginning of times, thorns symbolize both sin and the consequences of sin. And so here Jesus is taking upon his head the curse of all humanity, including the very sins of the soldiers who are abusing him. But then the story of the soldiers is all of a sudden interrupted by another character, a stark contrast, verse 21, a certain man from Cyrene, that's North Africa, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country And then they forced him to carry the cross. Now, if you've been reading through the Gospel of Mark, you will notice something in this passage, and it's one verse. Mark does not normally use proper names for anyone, but here he's including three people's names in one verse. Why all these names in one verse? Well, the names are presented as if Simon, a man from North Africa, is unknown to the readers, but... He's presenting the, his son's name as if they are known to the readers of this passage. And what, we know that. We know that Mark is writing to the church in Rome. And as we learn in Paul's epistle to the Romans in chapter 16, verse 13, one of their names comes up again, Rufus, prominent member of the church in Rome. He comes from a Christian family, And his mom, says the Apostle Paul, is like a mom to him, to the Apostle Paul. And so, think about what's happening here. Simon's faithfulness in carrying the cross of Jesus likely resulted in his son's participation in the faith and in the church. We've often seen in Mark acted parables, haven't we? We could call this an acted parable orchestrated by God. Earlier in Mark's gospel, chapter 8, verse 34, the key to being a disciple of Jesus Christ is what? Taking up your cross and following Jesus. And so, Simon Simon of Cyrene, he is the first person to very literally fulfill that command. And in Mark's, discipleship is not a symbolic command. It is literally following Jesus. And so the soldiers, they thought that they had just grabbed a bystander to carry Jesus' cross, but he was not a random bystander, as Mark's initial readers in Rome knew differently. And as we do now, God orchestrated the entire thing. Well, Mark concludes the scene one at Golgotha, which means uh, skull, the place of the skull or skull hill, Calvary in the Latin, And Mark adds details as to what the soldiers are doing. After stripping Jesus of his clothes and nailing Jesus' bloodied body to the cross, they divide up his clothes and they cast lots. They gamble for his clothing. Now again, the soldiers are absolutely clueless as to how they are fulfilling God's plan from all of eternity. Over 1,000 years earlier, 
this description had been written by the psalmist David about God's suffering Messiah, God's suffering Christ. Psalm 22. Listen to these verses. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, is melted away within me. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Think about it. These words were written a thousand years before the cross, before Jesus was nailed to the cross. What a shocking portrait of God. We sometimes picture Jesus earlier in Mark's gospel touching a man with leprosy or, or taking the hand of a dead girl, 12-year-old girl in her, in her bed. Honey, wake up. And that's sometimes the picture we have of Jesus, but the picture that most accurately portrays who God is is of Jesus being brutally executed. Here's a God who intentionally planned all of this, the worst moment of Jesus' own life, and then he walked resolutely to the cross, his own execution. Does it shock you that God came to this earth and that God came to die? Well, that's scene one. Now to scene two. Scene two also adds brush strokes to this portrait of God, and this time it doesn't end with, and begin and end with soldiers. It begins and ends with robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And in the middle of this scene are different kind of robbers, the religious kind, the chief priests and teachers of the law, members of the Sanhedrin that followed Jesus to the cross, not only to mock him, but to make sure that he was finished off. And the crowd, the Sanhedrin, riled up. They're still there. They're hanging around. And the entire scene is full of contempt. Everyone just hurling insults at Jesus, mocking him. Verse 31, he saved others, they said, but he cannot save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. We could call this the mocking scene. And it starts and it ends as it started, focusing back on these robbers again. One on Jesus' right hand, one on Jesus' left hand, and here they are on their own crosses, dying for their own sins, and yet they are even heaping insults on Jesus. Now, we do learn from Luke that one of them has a deathbed conversion, but here it's a bleak scene, and the words insults and mocked are repeated over and over again in this passage. Well, what do we learn about God in this second scene? Even as He was being mocked, God's plan was still unfolding. We've already seen that Jesus fulfills Psalm 22, verse 7, which says, All who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads. And then Psalm 109, verse 25 says, I am an object of scorn to my accusers. When they see me, they shake their heads. It's a very ironic scene because as Mark is telling the story in the Greek, verse 29, the word that he uses is blasphemy in the Greek which is used exclusively in Greek and biblical literature, ancient Greek and biblical literature, as evil speech against God. So what are they doing? They are hurling insults at God. The chief priests and the scribes and those who they have riled up, they're guilty. They're the ones who are guilty for the very thing that they have condemned Jesus for. It's very ironic. Psalm 37, verse 12 says, The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them, but the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. Proverbs 3, 34 says, He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and the oppressed. One of the ladies here this morning told me that her university professor is mocking Christians. It happens today. How does God mock proud mockers? 
He does it by turning their words against them. Biology professor Andrew Gosler from Oxford University, he was an atheist professor for 25 years. And something got his attention. Today he shares how Richard Dawkins, the popular atheist who mocks Jesus and mocks Christians, unwittingly led him to faith in Jesus Christ. And he's not the only one. Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, has left many intellectuals looking for answers that the book could not provide. And so a new book has been written with 12 essays by scholars, by various authors, and the title is, of the book is Coming to Faith Through Dawkins. Another story that I read was of a, a woman, a girl, named Irina Radishinskaya, and she was living in Odessa during the time of the Soviet Union. And she would go to these classes where they would indoctrinate the children, and every one of her teachers seemed to be mocking God, against God, just mocking Him, making fun of, of God, and, and making horrifying stories about Jesus' followers. And listen to what she says. She asked herself one day in class, Can they, can't they tell they're giving themselves away? Adults tell you there are no gremlins and ghosts. They tell you once or twice and that's it. But with God, they tell you over and over again. So he must exist and he must be very powerful for them to fear him so greatly. It's interesting because she went on a quest. Uh, she could not find a Bible. And so she went and she got all this old Russian literature out and she found quotes of the Bible from some of the old authors and she ended up coming to Christ and be receiving her first Bible when she was in her early 20s. She came to Jesus, and she began, she was an amazing poet, and she began writing poetry and circulating around the Soviet Union, and she ended up becoming imprisoned in the gulags for her uncompromising faith, and the KGB tried to destroy her. They tried to kill her with cold and starvation, and yet Irina survived, and she was thin, and she was frozen, and yet her poems kept getting smuggled out of the gulag and seeing countless young Soviets all over the country, much to their mocking teacher's dismay, turning to Jesus. As Jesus was hanging on the cross, being mocked, God's plan was still unfolding. Specifically, in the life of someone you would least expect that was standing there. And today, when people mock Jesus and mock Jesus' family, God's plan is still unfolding. Which brings us to scene three from Good Friday that was read earlier. And this scene doesn't start and end with soldiers and doesn't start and end with robbers, but it starts and ends with God. And in the middle of the scene is God, God the Son, hanging on the cross. The scene starts and ends with God and His miraculous hand at work, starting with supernatural darkness from the hand of God, and ending with God tearing the three and a half inch or nine millimeter, uh, nine millimeter thick curtain, centimeter curtain, in the temple, from top to bottom. God is in the beginning, middle, and end of the scene. In the middle, Jesus is on the cross crying out to His Father in the darkness, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, the crowd misunderstands the Aramaic word that He's using for God. It sounds very similar to the word for Elijah. And so, they think that Jesus is calling Elijah to come down and rescue them. And so, they offer Him a sponge, as you heard, with wine vinegar, and then they step back to see if Elijah will show up. Why is this happening? Well, in popular Judaism, they thought that because Elijah was taken up into heaven, that he didn't die, that he would return in times of crisis and help the righteous who were going through trial to protect them and rescue them. And so, what are they looking for? They're looking for a miracle to spare Jesus' life. But they totally missed the point of what's happening here. Jesus is fulfilling God's plan of redemption by dying. He's giving His life as a ransom for many and taking the curse of humanity upon Himself. 
In fact, that is the point of scene three. Here's what you see when we look at the portrait of Jesus hanging on the cross. Number three, Jesus' death on the cross is the portrait of how infinite God's love is for us. Here are the people, and they're looking for a miracle. But there's a miracle happening right before their own eyes. And it's far greater than they could ever imagine. In fact, it's interesting because there's two supernatural events framing this the scene, displaying the infinite love of God in all, all of His wisdom. Verse 33, darkness comes over the land for three hours. Now, this is not a natural phenomenon as some people like to think it was. It is a supernatural phenomenon. What does the darkness symbolize? Do you know? The darkness in the Bible symbolizes God's displeasure and His judgment. If you remember, darkness came over Egypt, the second last plague at the first Passover. But who is God judging now? Well, if you were here two weeks ago, when we looked at Jesus in the garden, you will remember. Indicated by the verse 34 in our passage, Jesus cries out, Eloi, Eloi, laba sabachthani, which is Aramaic for my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did you notice Jesus says, my God? This forsakenness is between the Father and the Son, who have loved each other perfectly for all of eternity. What's happening? Jesus is experiencing our judgment day our judgment day. He is being forsaken, so we never have to be forsaken. The judgment we deserve is falling on Jesus. Over 750 years earlier, the ancient prophet Amos describes God's judgment against sin this way. Listen to this. Amos 8 and 9, in that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Exactly what was happening. And so this miracle of darkness in the scene, it symbolizes God's wrath being poured out on His Son who is bearing the sins of the world. And Mark says that the moment that Jesus cries out is at 3 p.m. Why does Mark include 3 p.m.? Well, if you remember, it's Passover. And at the temple, at Passover, a lamb was killed at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m. But first, the priest would blow his shofar. A shofar was a trumpet. This is a real ram's horn. A trumpet that was made from a horn of a ram. Try it. As Ray Vanderlaan says, during Jesus' day, at the blowing of the shofar, all the people in Jerusalem, tens of thousands of people would stop and stand silent because right after the shofar would be the shedding of blood. The signal would be given, the horn blown, people stood in silence, and the lamb was killed and the blood offered. Except that this time, after they were standing there silent, after the shofar was blown, Mark says that Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. We know what some of those words were that he cried out. John says that Jesus cried out, it is finished. And Luke says that after that, Jesus added, just before he died, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Can you imagine this? On resurrection day, We hear evidence, right, from Luke, that the entire city is in uproar. Why? After the shofar is blown, the city is supernaturally dark. And after the shofar is blown, everything grows quiet. Everyone is standing in silence. And the loud cry of a dying man breaks the silence and echoes throughout the city. And then immediately, immediately, another miracle happens. The nine centimeter thick veil in the temple is torn in two. 
from top to bottom. Can you imagine how loud that would be when the city is in silence? It would have sounded like thunder. The curtain in the temple was 25 meters high. It was 80 feet high, embroidered with purple and gold thread. Can you imagine the sound of that being torn? On one side of that curtain was an area where people could go into, and on the other side was the space, the only space in the entire world where God's presence dwelled in all of his power and perfection. And the curtain was there to say, it's impossible to come into God's presence. You cannot come in here and survive. Your sin keeps you out. And we know that even the high priest, when he went in once a year on the Day of Atonement, would have to wear bells on the bottom of his garment that in case he died, they would hear the bells stop. There was a rope tied around his ankle and went outside. They would have to pull him out by the rope. Picture this thick, impenetrable curtain. And the curtain, the veil in the temple is torn in two the moment Jesus dies at 3 p.m. What's just happened? Jesus has died in the darkness. The robbers crucified on either side of Jesus, they continue to live for several hours after the darkness dissipates. The only person who has died in the darkness of God's judgment is the Son of God, God the Son Himself. And yes, the tear was from top to bottom, which gives us clear evidence that no one else did this other than God. It was God's way of making clear this is the sacrifice that has ended all sacrifices. The way is now open to approach me. Praise the Lord. In other words, that barrier is gone. And it's only possible because of what happened on that cross. To make sure that we get the point of what's happening here, Mark concludes that three Good Friday scenes with the most unlikely person to enter into God's kingdom. The first person after Jesus' death to publicly proclaim the deity of Jesus Christ. Verse 38, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. This is an even greater miracle. Why? This man was a brutal, hardened man. I read about it this week. As a Roman centurion, he did not get this position because of a family that he belonged to. No, he had risen up through the ranks, and he had seen a lot of death. In fact, he had inflicted a lot of death to a degree that you and I could never imagine. And yet the darkness in this man's heart has been penetrated. Why? How? He heard, verse 39, he heard Jesus cry and saw how Jesus died. Now, I've only been with a handful of people when they have breathed their last breath. And it's something that I will never forget. Every one of them. None of them were violent deaths. But this is true, and he had seen countless people brutally executed. And yet, even for him, this death was completely different. He saw something in Jesus' death like no other death he had ever seen. Jesus' tenderness, despite the terror of what he had been through, pierced the darkness of the centurion's heart. And this combined with supernatural darkness and the sound of thunder as the curtain was torn in two led him to this confession of faith. Do you remember how Mark chapter 1 verse 1 begins? The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And now after the climax, the most brutally hardened heart is flooded with light. Surely this man was the Son of God. Here's the truth. Jesus came into the world. He suffered and he died in order to save us. The ultimate proof of God's infinite love for us. And what does that mean? God hasn't abandoned you. He has not abandoned you. Jesus was abandoned for you on the cross and paid for your sins. Why? To show you that God the Father will never abandon you. The cross is the ultimate portrait of how much Jesus and how much God loves you. 
As Tim Keller once wrote, Jesus Christ not only died the death we should have died, he also lived the life we should have lived but can't. His was perfect obedience in our place. It doesn't matter who you are, centurion, prostitute, hitman, minister. The curtain has been ripped from top to bottom. The barrier is gone. There's forgiveness and grace for you. Which brings us to today. Have you, like the centurion, made this declaration, surely this man is the Son of God? Have you placed your faith and your trust and his sacrifice for you? If not, can I just ask you a question? What's holding you back? You can simply pray with me this prayer of faith. And it's up on the screen. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much that you sent the Lord Jesus, your one and only Son, to die in my place. Thank you for proving that Jesus is who he says he is. I put my complete trust in his death and resurrection. Jesus sacrificed for my sins. Thank you for the gift of eternal life that Jesus promised. Send your Holy Spirit to live inside of me so that I could be transformed to be like Jesus. In Jesus' strong name, amen. Can I just say that if you prayed that prayer with me, if you placed your trust in Jesus and you really meant it, even just now, you are invited to join with us as we celebrate his sacrifice and remember his sacrifice at the Lord's table. I'm going to invite those who are giving out the elements to come and join us up here at the front. This morning we were reminded of God's great love for humanity and the fact that he went as far as the cross for us, to give us a way to spend eternity with Him in heaven, our sin, our sin put Jesus Christ on that cross. But He knew that this was the only way to pay the penalty for our sin. So not only is Good Friday an annual reminder of Christ Jesus on the cross, but God has given us the Lord's Supper, communion, monthly, regularly, to focus on the cross all year long. And Jesus gave us this commemoration. We call it communion, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, breaking of bread, to reflect what Jesus did for us on the cross by becoming the sacrifice for our sins. Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 says that as Jesus was eating the Passover meal with his disciples, that Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. And then he He took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 records that Jesus added these words, Do this in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we are going to do that. We're going to celebrate, and we're going to remember the Lord's table together as Jesus commands us to, until he returns. And let me just again say, this table is for those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus, and if you've done that even this morning, you're welcome to join us. As you are receiving the bread and the cup, please just keep them with you as we take them together in unity when we've all been served. Thank you. As the elements are being distributed, we are going to be singing. I'm going to ask you to remain seated. It will be a lot easier for us.
Let us pray, thanking God for the bread. Christ Jesus, when you came into this world, you said to the Father, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And then you came in the incarnation, and by the single offering of your body on the cross, you did what all of the offerings on Israelite altars could never accomplish, the complete forgiveness of our sins. Bread of heaven, as we now partake of this emblem of your body, would you ravish our hearts and refresh our souls. Amen. Let's now thank the Lord for the cup. Jesus, lover of our souls, and Gethsemane, you looked into the cup that you would drink in order to redeem us from our sins, and it was so awful that you prayed, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, and yet not what I will, but what you will. And then you did the hardest thing done in time and eternity as you shed your blood to secure our salvation so that we may come to your table and partake of the cup in deep remembrance of what you did on the cross. As we ponder partaking of the cup, our hearts affirm these words, this is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let us continue to worship the Lord together. We invite you to stand if you are able as we close with the wonderful cross on which the, our Lord and Savior died for us, gave us freedom and gave us life. Let us sing. When I survey the
attempt on all my pride. Sing me from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love As we close today, just a, one comment I'd like to make, and that's that it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. I hope you're here Sunday, and can I encourage you to do something on Sunday? Come early, because right at 9 o'clock, we're going to start off with four baptisms, and so we don't want people walking in while... People are being baptized and sharing their testimony. Sorry, 10 o'clock, sorry. <laughs> if you come at 9, you'll be here on time. <laughs> Tricked you, no. Uh, but please be here early um, so that those who are sharing their testimonies are not distracted by those coming in the back. Also, just please be in prayer for our dear brother, Alfred Demche who is in the hospital, uh, he's not well, and pray that the doctors will find out the cause of, of his illness, and his son is with us, I believe. Uh, Elias is back here. Would you please uh, convey to your father our love? We would really appreciate that. Let us close with this beautiful benediction. May the God of peace, 
who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in the Lord's peace today.